So we're returning to our study of world history. And our goal has been to try to understand the major movements in the various ages of world history and see them through the lens of scripture so that we can put them together with what the Bible teaches. We obviously finished up with the 20th century and um, when we talk about history now, we have to talk about future history. So we're working on understanding what the Bible says that the history of the world will be like. And that means we're dealing with prophecy. And so um, this morning, what I want to do is read together from Matthew chapter 24, <coughs> which is the one message that Jesus preached, or at least part of it, about prophecy. And so we want to read together from Matthew 24, beginning at verse 1, uh, if you'll join me uh, on the yellow print as usual. 24.1, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he, he said to them, them, do you not see all of these things? things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but this is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another, and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise, and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increasing, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get his things out of the house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. Woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and 
they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now, this is the introduction to Jesus' prophetic sermon. Um, it continues the rest of chapter 24 in Matthew and also in chapter 25. We're going to look at this part of it this morning. In order to see it in its context and understand it, I want to flash back to what we looked at last week in the book of Daniel. These were significant dates in Daniel, and we can date most of the chapters pretty accurately in Daniel, with chapter 9 being at 538 B.C. That's in the first year of the Persian Empire. And Daniel prays in chapter 9 this prayer asking God to fulfill his promise to send the nation of Israel back to the land. He says, I read in the book of Jeremiah that God had said 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, I will send my people back to the land. So Daniel says, we're at about 69 years. So I'm going to start praying. And he was asking God to send the people of Israel back. And so he gets a, a, a message from Gabriel. That message is in the context of the preceding information which Daniel was given in the various dreams. In chapter 2, there was a dream of a statue that represented different kingdoms, and it was struck by the stone, uh, which represents the kingdom of heaven. And then, in Daniel's message from Gabriel, he receives these words. We read, After the 62 weeks... Messiah will be cut off, and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. What Gabriel said to Daniel is, there's going to be seven weeks, and 62 weeks, and one week. It's called the 70 weeks promise that God made. We talked about that last week. And he divided that 70 weeks, or 70 times 7, into three parts. First part is seven weeks, or 49 years. Second part is 62 weeks. And the third part is one week, or seven years. And the statement from God through Gabriel to Daniel is that after the 69 weeks, we would have these two things that would happen. So this gap between the 69th week and the 70th week are very important. We talked about that a little bit last week, just re kind of reviewing to bring us up to speed. So, what happens then is that what Gabriel was saying to Daniel is that there are two things that are going to happen after the end of the 69 weeks. Messiah is going to be cut off, that's a cross, and the city is going to be destroyed. city of Jerusalem destroyed. We know now, because we're in 2024, we know now that this happened in 70 A.D., <coughs> Daniel doesn't know when those things will happen. He only knows that these two events are going to take place after the 69th week. So, if you have 7 and 62 times 7, you have 483 years. So, he knows that after 483 years, these two things are going to happen, and then there's going to be another 7-year period in the future. Then, the last verse in that message from Gabriel divided this week the seven years into two parts he said he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction is, is, is decreed and is poured out on the one who makes desolate so the seven years the final seven years in that period over here are the 69 weeks and then Messiah is cut off and then the city is destroyed and at some point in the future there's a seven year period. That's what Gabriel is saying to Daniel in 538 BC. Okay, And he says this is what it's going to look like. This schematic now is very important because this schematic 
sets the stage for understanding New Testament prophecy, in my opinion. It's the best way to understand what's going to take place. Now, let me show you how that works. All right? We're going to go, uh, well, here's just a summary of what we looked at last week in terms of this 70 weeks. And all of this is going to be accomplished in God's program. So it's God's program for the nation of Israel in the 70 weeks of Daniel. 69 of which are now past and one which is future. All right? So here's, well, again, what we looked at last week just at the end there in terms of these events taking place. And what the New Testament does is to put the church age in here. But you don't know that yet. All right? We don't know that in terms of the development of prophecy. Even in Jesus' time, we don't know what all's going to happen here. Jesus simply says, I will build my church, but he doesn't really tell us anything about it, okay? So, Jesus comes on the scene then. Daniel is 538 B.C. Now, we're at about 30 A.D. So, we're 560 years, 570 years later. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he comes preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, Jesus comes to the Jewish people to offer them the kingdom. What happens in his ministry is that he's rejected, right? That he is not accepted by the Jewish people. And so here's an outline of Matthew's gospel. Matthew presents for us the gospel of the kingdom. In my judgment, the thesis of the book of Matthew is the rejection of the messianic king and his kingdom prompts the introduction of the mystery kingdom. And so here in chapters 11 and 12, we have um, the nation of Israel rejecting. John the Baptist is struggling to understand the cities. Jesus says, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles done in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented ages ago and so forth. And the Pharisees reject him. Three times in chapter 12, we have stories of the Pharisees rejecting Jesus. So in chapter 13, Jesus begins with the parables of the kingdom. You all know the parable of the soils. So he talks about the soils. And his disciples come to him at that point, and they say to him, Why are you talking in parables? Now, when they ask that question, it indicates what? They don't that they don't understand what he's saying, but what else? Something new. It's something new. They wouldn't say, why are you speaking in parables, had he been speaking in parables all along. So something new is happening when you get to Matthew 13. And what's new is that Jesus is revealing truth about the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He says, I'm speaking in parables because... To you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has to do with the changes that are going to take place in the kingdom program because Jesus is rejected. And so then he prepares his disciples for ministry in his absence. And then we have the official rejection. So we have Palm Sunday. We have then the official rejection of Jesus and eventually we have his passion, his crucifixion, and resurrection. But right before that happens, we have Matthew 24 and 25. And so what we have here is then Jesus' prophecy about the kingdom. And so what he's saying on either Monday or Tuesday before he's crucified, one day or two days before he's crucified, he's saying, I'm still coming, folks. I'm still coming. In spite of the fact that I've been telling you about the mystery form of the kingdom, I'm still coming. And so the prophecy in Matthew 24 is about Jesus coming. He's on the Mount of Olives looking over the city of Jerusalem. And the disciples come and they say, do you see all these beautiful buildings? And Jesus says at the beginning here, do you see all of these? There will be not one stone left upon another. Now, why does he say that? What's going to happen after the 69th week? 
Messiah will be cut off and the city will be destroyed. So he knows that's coming. So he speaks to his disciples to prepare them for the fact that that's coming. And so he says, see to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name and so forth. Now, here's the schematic that we had for Daniel 9.27, right? <laughs> Seven years divided into two halves. I want you to see Jesus' statements in this section that we're looking at in Matthew 24. Jesus is on Monday or Tuesday. The triumphal entry has just happened on Sunday. And it's either Monday or Tuesday of that week that Jesus is pronouncing this sermon. Go back and check it out in the book of Matthew. In Matthew 21, you have the triumphal entry. In 22 and 23, you have the rejection of the, of the religious leaders and so forth. And Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and, and this whole list of, of, um, of his warnings to them. And then we come to chapter 24, and he says these things. So, what he says, first of all, is there will be wars and rumors of war. That's what we just read here in Matthew chapter 24. And then he says there will be famines and there will be earthquakes in all different places in the world. And then he says this is only the beginning of birth pangs. What does he mean, the beginning of birth pangs? Before the second coming? Well, what are birth pangs? The start of something. The start of labor, a woman's labor process, right? And so what he's saying is, these things that are happening here are only the beginning stages of the process, like initial pains that come when a woman's ready to give birth. And so these are really difficult things, but this ain't the worst, is what he's saying. This is only the beginning. This is only the start. Then he says, there'll be tribulation and persecution. And then he adds, lawlessness will be increased. And the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached throughout the entire world. So, these things are going to happen, Jesus says. And then he makes this statement, which is critical to understand the structure. Then he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place and then he adds let the reader understand or Matthew adds it maybe under the inspiration of the spirit of God what is this designed to do it's designed to have you hearken back to here because this is what was spoken through Daniel the prophet Gabriel brought the message that the seven years were to be divided in the middle by one who makes an abomination and who desolates the temple, the sanctuary. And so Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation. So we have then a middle point in terms of what he's developing as he presents his prophetic schematic. And then he adds these words. Residents should flee from Jerusalem. When you see this happen, get out of Dodge, is his statement. Run for it. Don't stay in Jerusalem, but head out into the wilderness. Because great tribulation is coming. How many of you here have had babies? <laughs> Guys, what was it like? Dan, was it tough? Yeah. Was it? <laughs> okay. Very tough. We really, if we want to understand birth pangs, you have to talk to the ladies, right? As the ladies, you know that the process starts and there are some faint pains. With our firstborn, Fran wasn't even aware that she was entering into labor. And her mother insisted that she go to the doctor. And by the time she got to the doctor's office, the doctor says, you got to get her to the hospital right away. She's going to have the baby here in the office. Because the pains were not that severe at the beginning. 
but in the final stages, <laughs> the pains are severe, right? You hold on to the bedpost or whatever um, they provide for you. And so he goes on to say there'll be false Christ everywhere. The heavens will be darkened. The, sky, the stars will fall from the sky and so forth. And then he says, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. So what Jesus does is to utilize the Old Testament schematic for the development of his prophetic message. He takes that basic schematic and expands it. All right? Gabriel didn't say all of this stuff to Daniel. He just said, there's going to be three and a half years, there's going to be abomination of desolation, there's going to be another three and a half years, and then the one who desolates will be destroyed. What Jesus does is he amplifies this as he presents this information in the course of uh, his sermon. And then he says, at this point now, the Son of Man will appear in the heavens and, and I will return. So this statement by Jesus in verse 15 is critical to understanding the structure of what he's trying to say. And it lays out for us exactly an overlay and expansion of Daniel's prophecy. All right? So then the sign of the Son of Man appears in the heavens. We don't know what that is. I project that it's going to be some sort of like a flaming cross in heaven. It's kind of like the star that signaled Jesus' birth. It wasn't a natural star. It was a supernatural shining of some kind. And at this point, as we come to the end of that seven years, what we're going to have is a sign in the sky. The whole world will see this cross in the sky or something, whatever it is, it's clearly going to say Jesus Christ to the whole world. And then he will come to set up his kingdom. So what we have in this process then is Jesus' amplification of the prophecy that was given to Daniel in Daniel 9.27. Now, you're going to have to take my word for it but I'm going to take you here in two weeks to show you how the same schematic is the best way to understand the book of Revelation. So you don't want to miss that. Right? Okay? So we're going to go and we're going to see that and I'm going to let you work it through with me to understand that. But before we do that, I want to just wrap up today with an understanding that the Apostle Paul is going to add something that is not a part of Jesus' teaching. What the Apostle Paul adds is that there will be the rapture of the church that takes place prior to the start of this seven-year period with the wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famine, and um, people's love growing cold, etc. You're not going to be here for that unless you are post-tribulational, which I don't recommend, <laughs> right? Because the Apostle Paul is pre-trib, and he puts the rapture of the church over here. And next week, I'm going to show you why it's over there, okay? So next week, we're going to look at the rapture, and why is the rapture pre-tribulational rather than in here, like some? or over here, like many. Okay, question. I'm reading a book right now called The Great Disappearance by David Jeremiah. Jer Jeremiah. It's really good, yeah. really good. It's been advertised on TV a lot as he's um, preaching about the rapture and so forth. Good book. And when, excuse me, when um, Daniel prophesied all of that, and did that have to happen? In, because didn't the prophets have to, didn't their prophecies have to come to be, or else they would be stoned? So did did something like this happen then in Daniel, or like? No, this is future prophecy in Daniel. This is a statement from um, 
from Gabriel to Daniel mm -hmm. that 70 weeks have been determined. And we saw last week that there was a start date for that. Mm -hmm. And then there was a time after the 69 weeks when Messiah would be cut off. So that part has been fulfilled. But it's all a future for Daniel. Okay, so they had prophecies that didn't, wouldn't need to be fulfilled in their lifetime. In their own lifetime, yes. Some prophecies were, but a prophecy like this is future. Good question. How does it jump from weeks to years? Um, that's a good question. Um, you have 77s is what, is what the text says. And so you have to say, is it 77s of days? That'd be 490 days, which is how long? A year and a half. A year and a half, right? So a year and a half is not enough time for that to happen. It could be 70 weeks, 70 times 7 weeks, or 490 weeks. How long would that be? 10 years. Right. That'd be 52 weeks in a year. So 490 would be just short of... Um, short of 10. Yeah, short of 10 years. So that's not really long enough either because we haven't started yet. So you have to just reason it out that way. Do you go to months? So then you have 490 months? Or do you go years? In the context, Daniel has been praying about 70 years. And the prophecy was that Israel would be brought back into the land after 70 years. And Daniel saying, Lord, the 70 years is complete. Are you, going to, are you going to fulfill the kingdom now? And so the statement from Gabriel's 77s. So 70 times 7 in the context of his prayer for the 70 years to be fulfilled. And then it makes sense in terms of plugging that in. And then, and then we can look back and say, okay, now Messiah was cut off when? When was Jesus cut off? We know he was cut off roughly 33 A.D. So we can count the years. And that's partly how we understand it. Okay, good question. All right, we need to wrap. Um, and we'll come back next time and uh, look at this, Lord willing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, revelation that Jesus has provided for us, both through the book of Daniel and also through his message. I pray that you would help us as we seek to uh, grasp, grab hold of this and internalize it and understand what it is that you're saying about the future. I thank you, Lord, for the hunger for your word. I pray that you would just help us as we seek to understand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.